the Forest Health Program Director for the, Na the Nature Conservancy. Her work focuses on bringing multiple stakeholders together to achieve common goals in forest health, including managing the Don't Move Firewood campaign. Lee's leadership of the Don't Move Firewood campaign has led to it being widely regarded as one of the most innovative public outreach arms of the Nature Conservancy. Lee earned her BA in biology at Williams College and her MS in wildlife biology at the University of Montana in Missoula, where she studied the intersection of native wildlife and invasive plants. Lee is an avid birder, a decent gardener, and a pretty good maker of baked goods and a periodic knitter. So at this point, I will turn things over to Lee to get us started. Thanks very much for the introduction, Amy. Does my sounds uh, sound okay? It does. Thank you, Lee. Great. Um, well, hopefully we've got the share screen uh, correct and everybody can see our first slide. I got a good nod from Amy, so that's great. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm coming to you from Montana, which is on mountain time. Um, so it's a little bit earlier here. Um, and I'm very excited to be talking to an audience, I would think primarily from Pennsylvania, but also probably some folks in the region. Um, like Amy said, I work for the Nature Conservancy, which is a global conservation organization. We have a bunch of different sections of the Nature Conservancy, so I like to start out my broad presentations like this with a little explanation of kind of how the Nature Conservancy works. Um, as a global organization, we have uh, state chapters, regional chapters, and country chapters. And in Pennsylvania, there's a Pennsylvania chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And those people are great, but I don't actually work with them directly because I work for the North America region. The North America region of the Nature Conservancy addresses big overarching topics that touch down across the North American continent. So things like climate change, the importance of sustainable agriculture, that sort of thing. And specifically, I'm the Forest Health Program Director. And as the Forest Health Program Director, I work on issues of for forest insects and diseases that negatively impact North American trees, specifically invasive forest insects and diseases. And uh, if you're watching the color of my video change back and forth, it's probably because the sun's setting and I'm sorry if it's a little distracting. Uh, it's, a, it's one of those things on Zoom that you can't control. So today what I'm here to do is talk about forest pests and firewood very specifically because firewood is one of the most important ways that forest pests and pathogens move around North America once they've arrived on the North American continent. So interestingly, in the state of Pennsylvania, you're actually in one of the most densely populated states for forest pests and pathogens, which frankly is a little disappointing. And what it is, is that the patterns of forest pests that enter the United States are directly linked to trade. And you in Pennsylvania have had intercontinental trade for one of the longest amounts of time of any part of the United States. So those dark blue and purple states that you see, so Pennsylvania, Northern New Jersey, New York, Western Connecticut, those are the parts of the United States that have had substantial intercontinental trade starting in Europe, moving across to a global trade system for the longest amount of time. And trade is primarily how forest pests enter the United States. So it's not because somehow California is different in any other substantial way from the East Coast. It's just because the East Coast has been trading with uh, other countries for much longer than the West Coast has. Now, when we talk about the forest pests and pathogens that have come here from trade, we can look at a long and pretty destructive history of things that have arrived in North America and completely wrought havoc on our uh, native trees. So we can start with some of the earliest arrivals, such as white pine blister rust, which didn't have a huge impact on eastern trees, so you may not have heard of it. But then you get to the next one that you've probably heard of, which is spongy moth. Its former name is an offensive term. So that former name is gypsy moth. I won't use it again. The new name is now spongy moth in light of the fact that that term is not preferred by uh, basically scientific societies. Spongy moth arrived in the late 1800s 
And uh, you know it now to be one of the things that kills oak trees on bad years, essentially, and can denude whole forests at the edges of its infestation. After that came chestnut blight. Now shown in this black and white picture is what the chestnuts of the Appalachians looked like before chestnut blight killed them all. And you might have heard that the American chestnut is just now sort of seeing the light by scientific societies trying to bring it back uh, onto the landscape more than 100 years later. Another really infamous forest pest and pathogen that started on the Eastern United States is Dutch elm disease. That killed the American elms. And it's in many of our lifetimes on this call when it killed the American elms. And the remaining elms are very few and far between. And the US Forest Service, along with their many partners, are trying to find those remaining elms and help breed them to create a functional population in the future. Emerald ash borer is one that I would suspect everybody on this webinar might have heard of. That's the one that is currently uh, killing uh, ash trees all around North America. Unfortunately, it uh, started actually um, in the Great Lakes region. It re reached Pennsylvania pretty darn quickly and um, has spread to most of the states in the eastern U.S., as well as a very recent and first find in the western states of being in Oregon last summer. So these forest pests and pathogens are really commonly uh, found. I am not by any means going through the history of all of them because that would take us the full 45 minutes to an hour and be honestly not that interesting, uh, but it is a pretty substantial list. Last but not least that I'm going to mention is spotted lanternfly. That has the dubious achievement of actually first being found in the state of Pennsylvania. It was first located, I wrote this down so I'd get it right, in 2014. And unfortunately, as you probably all know, it's pretty gross and it's kind of everywhere and it's spreading to other states. Now, spotted lanternfly, thankfully, is not appearing to be something that will kill lots of forest trees, although it is really gross and a huge nuisance, but it will likely be a problem in cities because it likes um, the tree of heaven, which is its favorite tree, uh, which is a substantial urban tree. And then also it is a significant problem in um, grapes and apples, which uh, apples are obviously trees, but grapes are not. And so it's an agricultural sector pest as much as it is a pest for uh, the tree of heaven. So these are just a few of the forest pests that I work on as part of my work as a forest uh, pest and pathogen specialist under the forest health uh, part of the Nature Conservancy. So let's see. Oh, that's right. I thought we would do a little quiz so that I was sure that everybody was awake. So, uh, oops, wrong button, sorry. So if everybody could take a moment to please see if they can navigate to the chat and tell me if they remember what the new name of this pest is. And you can just type it into the chat. I see there's not a ton of people here, which is fine. Um, that'll keep it more interactive. So I can use the chat. Um, I'll open it up. See if I can do that to everybody. Hello. Put the name of this pest in the chat. Actually, I'm going to say put the new name of this pest in the chat. See if anybody's able to figure this out. Sometimes on the presentation mode of these webinars, it's a little hard to use the chat. So if you can't and you get frustrated, just let it go. Don't worry about it. But does anybody remember what I said was the new name for this pest? This is the quiz part. You're being graded. Amy, do you remember what the new name is for this? Because uh, Amy remembers, she put it in the host chat that it's spongy moth. Okay, well, uh, I see that everyone else is feeling like they either can't or don't want to use the chat. So this is the spongy moth. It is, uh, <laughs> um, it comes in two different colors. There's the male color and the female color. So the male color is that darker kind of brown and the female color is the lighter kind of brown. And then that orange stuff is their eggs. And their eggs, in this case, is the firewood connection. So the moths themselves don't typically get transported in firewood. But any firewood anywhere near a spongy moth infestation could potentially have these eggs on them. Now on this particular tree, they do kind of stick out because they're orangish and freshly laid and the tree itself is kind of a gray. Um, but in other environments, sometimes they really, really blend in. And also they do kind of fade out um, a little bit with UV rays and so forth. And so they're 
they're pretty hard to see, honestly. Um, and so you can imagine a pile of firewood with just intermittent little packs of eggs from the spongy moth could easily relocate hundreds of spongy moth eggs to a new environment. Oops, somebody put it in the Q&A. Oh, the chat is disabled. Oh, goodness. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for telling me that. Well, then I will have to not actually do my um, <laughs> my Q&A or my, uh, my pop quiz. So I'll keep going um, and I'll skip the quiz aspect of it. So I, the next thing I was going to quiz you on, but I won't, is this firewood that has an absolutely uh, classic pattern of emerald ash borer larval infestation on it. So they start out small and they form what's called this zigzag gallery. You all may be very familiar with this because Pennsylvania has had an emerald ash borer infestation for a very long time. And as they get bigger, the gallery grows because it's about the width of their body and it gets bigger and bigger and the loops get bigger and bigger. And then finally they emerge. And the firewood does not or excuse me, the ash tree does not have to be alive to permit the full growth of an emerald ash borer from egg to adult. And so as you can see, this piece of firewood may indeed, I don't know, um, have been transported from the site of its original infestation. And then the uh, removal of the bark shows that there was an uh, emerald ash borer that completed its life cycle within this piece of firewood. So any ash tree that has been recently infested or recently killed by the emerald ash borer in theory could have multiple emerald ash borers completing their life cycle as seen in this uh, photograph of a piece of firewood. And so anybody who moves any firewood that is from an ash tree could potentially be moving the emerald ash borer to a new location. Now emerald ash borer uh, does require both a male and a female insect in order to complete their life cycle. So generally speaking, you would need to have both of those in order to start a new infestation. But if you think about multiple individual insects in any given piece of firewood and how many pieces of firewood you usually use all at once whenever you're having a fire, the chance that you would move enough emerald ash borers to actually allow for some reproduction in a new infestation is pretty substantial. So when we look at how emerald ash borer spreads, we see a lot of instances where it almost certainly came from people unintentionally moving emerald ash borer infested firewood to a campground, to uh, where they are going to heat their home, to uh, a place where they're going to go hunting, so they would like to have a fire near um, that area, whatever it might be. And that's one of the reasons that emerald ash borer sort of became infamous for um, firewood movement is because it, it occurs in ash, which does make nice firewood, admittedly, and it's so easy to transport multiple individuals within firewood. So all right, Amy tells me via chat that hopefully my quiz idea will work on the second try. Thank you for the person who said that the chat was off. Let's try this again. All right, does anybody know by looking at the horror that is this firewood, what happened to this firewood? What is in, what forest resident did this to this wood? And you can just put it in the chat. And I will not make fun of you if you get it wrong, I promise. Um, and the answer is not emerald ash borer and it is not spongy moth, but we'll see if anybody is willing to put themselves on the line and put another guess in. Does anybody know what happened to this wood in the chat? Or we can give up on this idea if nobody's willing to be chatty. If it's too late in Pennsylvania to be interactive, that's okay. All right, I'm not seeing any responses. <laughs> that might be because the chat's still off. Okay, Amy has a guess and Diana has a guess. So Amy guesses that it's ALB, which is the abbreviation for Asian longhorn beetle. Diana guesses that it is Dutch elm disease, which is a very good guess too. Does anybody have another guess um, that they'd like to share? All right. Three, two, one, seeing none, Amy gets the advantage. It is in fact, Asian longhorn beetle. The Asian longhorn beetle uh, infestation in Massachusetts is specifically where this particular photograph comes from. But there are Asian longhorn beetle point infestations. They're quite limited uh, in Massachusetts, Ohio, uh, Long Island, New York, uh, South Carolina. And there are former infestations that were uh, 
eradicated in Chicago, um, other parts of New York, other parts of New Jersey, et cetera. Asian longhorn beetle is um, particularly devastating to maple trees. And this is a picture of a maple tree. Uh, and when they um, breed, they chip little holes in the surface of the tree that are pretty surficial. They're, they're not really deep. But when they emerge as adults, they create this perfectly round, really thick, like, um, like the size of a, you could stick a whole pencil into it, hole for when they're emerging from the tree as an adult. And what you're seeing in this picture, both in the damaged insides of the heartwood of the trees, as well as the um, actions on the outside of the trees, is a combination of those uh, perfectly round, deep, emergence holes and the egg laying kind of chipped out surface holes. So this is a very damaging pest. And were this pest not to be currently under an eradication program in every single location that it's been found, this particular pest would absolutely devastate all the maples of North America. Thankfully, it is being eradicated in all of its locations. And this firewood uh, is not actually really firewood. This is part of the wood that was about to be chipped in order to destroy the pest where it was found in Massachusetts. So thankfully, this is not somebody's firewood pile. This is in fact a control action, but it does look a lot like firewood. So it's helpful to see how incredibly dangerous to uh, the structure of trees the Asian longhorn beetle can be. This one is not a quiz because I can pretty much guarantee you guys you won't know what it is, but this is an entirely different forest pest called a shot hole borer. There's multiple different types of shot hole borers and uh, there's several different types that are currently infesting South, uh, Southern California trees and these are often used in firewood. And so this is actually a firewood pile that was found from that had been cut from a tree infested with shot hole borers. Now, shot hole borers are particularly worrisome because unlike the emerald ash borer, they can actually reproduce with just females alone. They don't actually really need both males and females. And in fact, there's some species of shot hole borers where they basically don't even have males anymore. So it is easy, as you can imagine, that even a single piece of wood, which as you can see has evidence of lots of different beetles, would have plenty of, in this case, female beetles that are doing just fine on their own, that could be moved anywhere in firewood and allowed to spread and allowed to create this, you know, um, very Swiss cheese looking wood, which eventually creates uh, uh, the death of the tree through fungal infestation that's brought on by the shot hole borer, as well as just overall stress on the tree from the entire system of being infested with all of these tiny burrowing beetles. Last but not least, I'll ask you guys a, a, a question on this one. Does anybody know what caused this tree damage? You can put it right into the chat or you can put it in the Q&A if you're struggling with the chat, um, that's fine too. Um, I'm trying to make sure everybody's still paying attention. So anybody know what did this? Spotted lantern fly is the guest from Robert, one of our uh, People. Uh, the yellow bellied woodpecker is a guest from Mary Jo, one of our participants, like Robert. Anybody else? Not seeing anybody else, but those are great guesses. So, spotted lanternfly is an interesting guess because spotted lanternfly can create like a drippy effect on trees. And yellow bellied woodpecker is a really good guess because that's probably pretty much what it was. So one of the tricky things about forest pests and pathogens is that first of all, there's native forest pests and pathogens that create tree damage that are part of the natural ecosystems of forests. But the other thing is that other types of damage can sometimes look a lot like non-native forest insects and diseases. And the actions of the sapsucker family, which is just synonymous with woodpeckers, there's different types of birds in that group, um, can often look like a forest pest. And in fact, this is probably a yellow-bellied sapsucker or yellow-bellied woodpecker damage. And these round holes, like I said, can easily be mistaken for Asian longhorn beetle holes. But the Asian longhorn beetle holes go like straight into the tree. Like you can literally stick a pencil in it and it stays in the tree. Whereas sapsucker holes, if you ever see them, are usually in a little straight array like this picture. And they don't go very deep. 
They are weepy though, um, because the sap does flow out of them as you can see in this picture. And so I can see how the spotted lantern flies like sticky stuff that comes out of it um, kind of came to mind from the, from the image. So thanks to everybody who actually participated in my quiz. I was just trying to make sure I keep everybody's attention while we kind of get into the forest pest and firewood topic. Let's see. The next slide. So we went through a bunch of different historical forest pests, and then we just talked about a bunch of different very specific scenarios of pests, but I thought I would bring us back to the fact that firewood itself is a really broad pathway for invasive forest insects and diseases. Forest pests can move on firewood, like we saw with the picture of the spongy moth egg cases, or in firewood, like we saw with the shot hole borer photograph um, on the far left of this slide, that brown um, slightly fuzzy insect is in the shot hole borer family, um, and or the Asian longhorn beetle moves in firewood and emerald ash borer moves in firewood. Um, all of these different mechanisms for insect infestation or contamination of firewood can allow otherwise totally fine firewood behaviors to become a forest pest transport behavior. So in order to tackle the fact that a seemingly typical firewood user might potentially move forest pests, we have regulations on the movement and the sale and so forth on um, firewood across the United States, but unfortunately it's a confusing universe. The regulations aren't comprehensive and they're not very consistent. And I'll get into that in a moment, just so that you can understand the complexity of the problem. The other thing is that new pest outbreaks come to light pretty much every year. It's not overwhelming, like every single pest shows up in a new place every year, but like we talked about, you know, in 2024, spotted lanternfly was discovered and now new locations of spotted lanternfly come to light pretty frequently. Um, in 2012, a new pest of beech, uh, beech trees was discovered called beech leaf disease. That's pretty disappointing. And that's now kind of traveling around the Eastern United States as well, which is, you know, not good for the health of beech trees. So the pest outbreaks, unfortunately, um, do happen and are problematic in that they, they do move around. Outreach about all of this is complicated. It's pretty challenging. And most of all, it's very difficult to change human behavior. Once somebody is determined to do something, as you might all imagine, it's really hard to change their mind. And so it's incredibly important for firewood, especially that people understand what's at stake here and how important it is to use local firewood or to buy heat treated firewood so that they don't accidentally move these very damaging pests around. So in order to run the Don't Move Firewood campaign, which is the outreach campaign that I manage across all of North America, we try to stick to our goal. And that goal is to protect trees. We are not trying to reduce the use of firewood. That's not what we're doing. We're trying to make sure that we maintain safety in firewood behaviors to protect those trees. The tactic that we're using to protect trees is slowing the spread of invasive forest pests via the firewood pathway. So moving, transporting, inappropriate distances of firewood movement. And in order to do that, we don't have to talk to everybody because not everybody uses firewood. We've done research and it shows that essentially about 50% of folks in the United States use firewood, more or less. Um, and uh, some of them use it for home heating, some of them use it for campfires and other forms of like recreational use, but it's about half. And so if you think about that, well, good. We don't have to talk to the other half of the country because they're not using firewood. So they don't need to know it's not important to transport firewood. And then we also do a lot of work with what we call stakeholder group educators. So that would be like folks that teach the classes of a master gardener course or professors that teach students or um, Forest Service employees that go out and talk to forest landowners. Those are the people we wanna make sure really understand the firewood issue so that they can bring it to their own people and the message can be spread far and wide. And we've got one overarching message, which is don't move firewood, but that doesn't tell you what to do. It only tells you what not to do. And so we wanna make sure people understand that we're not against firewood as a whole um, and we're not trying to ruin their vacation or prevent them from heating their home. What we're trying to do is again, protect trees. 
So we give them three different alternatives according to where they live and what they're interested in and basically what makes sense. Those three alternatives are don't <laughs> are buy firewood near where you burn it. So keep it local because then it won't transport anything because you're not transporting it very far. Uh, gather firewood on site because if you're going to be using it at a campsite and it's permitted to gather it near your campground, well, that isn't moving firewood very far either. Um, or you can buy certified heat treated firewood. And certified heat treated firewood is available in a lot of stores in the Eastern United States, less so in the Western. And what it is is firewood that has been heat treated to a uh, duration and temperature long enough to basically either kill or stunt all the insects in it. So more or less it's been made insect and disease free through heating. And um, certified heat treated firewood is important because somebody's actually paying attention to make sure the job gets done right. Just kiln dried firewood is a label that doesn't have oversight. It doesn't say whether or not somebody actually made sure the job got done right. And so certified heat treated firewood is the more reliable label. Thankfully in the state of Pennsylvania, there's a lot of certified firewood dealers and there's therefore there's a lot of it available on the market. So anytime anyone on this call was like, well, actually I was going to buy a bunch of firewood so that I knew I had good dry firewood when I went to my uncle's place for Thanksgiving in Ohio, that's fine. Buy certified heat treated firewood, find it for a price that you're comfortable with. And then you will not have to feel like you might be moving forest pests by accident. And you will not potentially cause that type of damage when you drive between states and potentially also violate the law, depending on what you're doing. So the Don't Move Firewood campaign works um, with all sorts of state, federal, tribal, private, academic, you name it, uh, partners in order to make sure that this information is accessible and it makes sense to people. So we have all sorts of website content and you're welcome to go to the Don't Move Firewood site whenever you'd like. And in fact, I would encourage you to. We've got a resource library with all sorts of cool um, posters and so forth. Uh, we have a firewood map. So if you're like, well, I know the rules in Pennsylvania pretty well, but I sure don't know what they are in North Carolina. You can just click on the state and figure out what their rules are. We have forest pest and pathogen species profiles so that if you're really excited about a particular pest and you wanna learn like everything about it, we have um, science-based information so that you can dig into the, your pest of interest. We have news, which is kind of like a blog or uh, we have some news releases. We do a little bit, of, we, when we have an interesting scientific paper that we've run across on the topic of firewood, we outline it there. Um, we also have our 10 most popular uh, pages translated into Spanish. So we call that our Spanish language microsite so that uh, Spanish speakers can use our website. And then we have all sorts of resources for outreach professionals. So if anybody on this webinar right now has any um, volunteer or professional experience right now where firewood information would be useful to you, we have tons of resources or you can reach out to me directly. October is our firewood month, which is an annual focus on a bunch of different themes for firewood education. And so that's why I asked Amy to schedule me in October so that I could be all excited about Firewood Month. And we do themes that I think are really useful to understand the scope of firewood education. So our first week, we talk about just generally what is the issue with the firewood pathway to transport forest pests. So we go with the broadest firewood using audience. Second week, we target fall recreationalists, hunters, campers, um, anglers that are traveling to go fishing in their favorite places. And then often also that's the week of fire prevention week. So we also talk a little bit about safe firewood behavior, um, fireplace and campground and so forth, um, safety behaviors. The third week, uh, we talk about forestry industries. It's really important to make sure that the forest industry is a partner in the Don't Move Firewood campaign and firewood education at large. Because like I've said multiple times, the issue itself is not firewood at all. It's the forest pest transport that can happen. So we talk about the importance of local sustainable forestry industries during National Products Forest Products Week as part of our Firewood Month highlight. And then last but not least, at the end of October, when it's starting to get pretty cold for most parts of the United States, especially here in Montana where I live, uh, we talk about home and cabin heating. So getting home and cabin heating wood locally uh, and being smart about the folks that you order a cord of wood from, knowing where they um, source their wood 
if you're in a place like Pennsylvania that has significant forest pest, pest presence, making sure they're in accordance with any local rules on firewood movement. Um, you would not want to, for instance, start a whole infestation of spotted lanternfly in a part of Pennsylvania that has uh, little to no spotted lanternfly right now just because you ordered a cord of wood from the wrong person. So uh, those are the different themes of Firewood Month. And what they really do is they highlight the different audiences and the different concepts that we cover in firewood education. Okay, we also recently put out a firewood comparison report, which is a tool for professionals to better understand what's going on regionally and nationally across the, stat the full status of firewood outreach education regulation and certification. Now, this uh, is probably way too deep in the weeds for uh, the presentation. However, I thought I would highlight that Pennsylvania actually in the firewood comparison report comes out pretty good. You've got really good longstanding um, appropriately strict firewood regulations that help to protect that help pr protect your state from additional forest pests and pathogens. Um, you also have good firewood certification capabilities, which means that the firewood harvested in the state of Pennsylvania um, can be certified as heat treated and that then safely shipped to other um, parts of the state or other states uh, in accordance to the local laws. So basically anybody who wants to um, have a fine upstanding firewood business has the legal tools to do so. But you do have a couple shortcomings in your outreach environment. Um, unfortunately, what we did find, which I looked up right before this call to make sure I had the information, is that while you've got really good Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and Pennsylvania um, Department of Conservation and Resources, I'm forgetting the name of the agency, I'm sorry, but those two agencies did really good with their outreach. Um, we found that uh, your state parks third party reservation site. So the place where you actually place your reservation for your favorite campsite or campground does not have the firewood regulation information on it, which is disappointing. So uh, there are 50 states and each one of them we did this same analysis for. And so hopefully we will be able to reach out to your state parks reservation entity and help them come up with some really good wording so that that small oversight, which is important for visitors can be remedied. But that's the type of thing that we do when we look at the full country and um, report out on their status. It's basically a way to make sure that everybody is doing the best possible job with firewood risk mitigation as is possible. Because like we talked about uh, earlier in this presentation, these forest pests can um, cause tremendous damage. Some of them are kind of gross, like the spotted lantern flies, sticky substances. And then some of them actually cause such significant issues that they might cause the functional extinction of entire species or even genus of trees. So you don't want to have holes in your outreach because those holes in your outreach could increase the chance that you get damaging pests in your state or region. And in fact, the biggest takeaway from all of our reporting in the last year or so of really digging into the comparisons between states is that we really could use a lot more consistency. Because like I said, changing people's behaviors once they've really set their mind to something is very difficult. So it would be better if every state in at least a given region was more consistent about what they ask people to do so that it was not so hard to change people's mind after the fact. You know what, I just covered this, um, but I'll, I'll be quick about it. So this is all 50 states. And what we found in general is the same as the pattern in Pennsylvania. The state agencies that hold regulations such as the Department of Agriculture or the DCNR or whatever in the state of Pennsylvania, they usually have pretty good outreach, high visibility firewood outreach. But then when you get all the way to the far right of this chart, um, unfortunately, we did find that like 29 different states reservation portals, so the actual page where you make the reservation, did not have firewood information. And if you think about it, if somebody doesn't really know about firewood regulations, they're not that likely to look at it on the Department of Agriculture's pages. They're going to see something on the state park reservation page because that's what they're doing. They're going camping. They don't connect firewood and the Department of Agriculture in their head. They just wanna go camping. So we're really hoping to see significant improvements in a chart like this in the future, if we did this again, 
where the state parks reservations and the state parks general information pages had as tall a green bar as the state agencies that hold those regulations. So that all the different partners within any given state are presenting a unified group of outreach messages that reach everybody evenly, no matter if they think about firewood or if they're just thinking about a campground. So I didn't want to use my full amount of time because quite frankly, it's much more interesting to um, talk to people and see the questions that they really have. And I'm excited to see that this is a very manageable size group. So we can do all sorts of Q&A. Um, and if the group is being quiet, I even have a couple questions um, pre-written down that I could use in order to spur conversation. So interesting to look at all the different invasive pests and diseases and see there are different um, ways to identify the different ones. It's, I liked your quiz. Sorry about the chat. We got it on. It's okay. Well. Oh, and you all know right. what? I I yeah. turned off my screen just a moment before I should have. So I'm going to put it back up. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Amy. That wasn't my intent. Oh, no, go for it. But I wanted to say uh, the majority of the work that we do uh, receives direct funding from USDA APHIS, which is the U.S. Department of Agricultural Animal, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. They have provided us with financial support for well over a decade of action on the Don't Move Firewood uh, campaign and the firewood issue at large. And I just wanted to say right off the bat that we really appreciate that funding. And it's really important for me to recognize the important role that they play in funding the Nature Conservancy. Um, so that's all. I got a little excited for the Q&A part, but I accidentally overlooked that crucial part. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that here in Montana, we don't get the fall colors of my youth. I grew up in um, New York, New England, and um, it's not as colorful here, but what we do get is quaking aspens. So uh, these are the beautiful gold quaking aspens that grow in my neighborhood. Um, and they make me think about New England and Pennsylvania and the um, beautiful Eastern deciduous forest every year. So that was my wrap up that I completely forgot to give you and I'm sorry, Amy. So now I will say, take it away, Amy. Green will come back together. Uh, one sec. There we go. Great. Wonderful. And as far as fall color goes, Lee, we're a little bit, I would say, ahead of schedule this year. Mm -hmm. And it looks like this weekend might be one of those kind of nearing peak times. Um, so everything is Great. looking beautiful. So <laughs> if only I could transport you back for just a second. <laughs> All right. Let's see what. So Robert has a question. Is there good cooperation between federal parks and state organizations? That's a great question. I would say that overall, yes, there's really good participation and coordination um, and partnerships between federal entities and state entities. However, it's a big country. And in some places, it is more challenging than others. Different priorities for different types of pests, especially as pests move across uh, the country. So for instance, if you've got a pest that um, is particularly common on a type of tree that doesn't really occur in the Western United States, the Western states might be less interested in um, control actions than the Eastern states. And so then you do get some interesting dynamics between different states, different regions, and sometimes federal actions versus state priorities. I think that's just, um, part of being a really, really big country with lots of different priorities, types of forests and types of pests. But I'm going to say overall, yeah, I think that the federal and the state um, parties that work on forest pests try very hard to work together productively and for the most part, I think are very successful at it. This is a question from Catherine. Should you check a wood pile for infestation? That's a really good question. So sure, you should definitely check wood piles for infestations. And you should always uh, consider learning what is appropriate to report as a forest pest and pathogen for your area. So for instance, I don't believe right now it's necessary to report emerald ash borer in the state of Pennsylvania because I think the whole state has had it for a long time. 
But for instance, if you were to uh, visit a cousin in California and find an emerald ash borer, that would be incredibly important to report. But what's really nice to, to remember is that visually inspecting firewood does not tell you whether or not it's infested with forest pests and pathogens. That is inadequate because some forest pests and pathogens are pathogens. They're literal diseases, funguses, and so forth, viruses, nematodes, um, you name it. And visual inspection cannot tell you if that firewood is infested and cannot tell you whether or not if you move that firewood, you would be bringing viable tree diseases um, along with you. So certainly, uh, if you want to learn more about your firewood or if you want to learn more about the forest pests in your areas, taking a look at uh, your firewood is really interesting and educational, um, but it is not a way to determine whether or not you can move firewood. Lee, I'm sorry if you covered this in the presentation, but when you were talking about, I believe, is it certified heated wood? Is that the correct uh, the, terminology? The formal terminology is certified heat treated with a hyphen. Heat treated. Okay, gotcha. Did you give a resource for folks? Like you said that there um, are specific places that you could purchase that wood. Is, is there a good resource? Is, would that be on the Don't Move Firewood webpage? Uh, we do not have a list of certified heat treated vendors of firewood. Um, it is very common in Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Ohio. Um, your part of the country, I would say, has the best availability of certified heat treated wood. You just literally look on the packaging. There's a seal um, and the seal is different shapes and sizes according to which state you're in because typically speaking, it's the state that does the certification and each state has a different seal or stamp. Um, but mm -hmm. you just look for that terminology, certified heat treated firewood. Hmm. Okay. All right, who else might have a question out there? So we, we did get one person saying that the fall colors are lovely in England, which is really cool actually, uh, that's good to hear. Let's take a quick trip. We'll run over. <laughs> check out the check out the colors there. Well, I had a question about since you know you always you have your brain towards invasive pests and diseases and things. Um, as far as like invasive pests, is there anything that you guys are tracking that might be coming our way um, as things that we should kind of start listening for or paying attention to? That's a really great question. I would say um, during your slideshow at the beginning of uh, this presentation, I saw that you have a like world-renowned rhododendron collection or something, mm -hmm. and that's amazing. And one of the biggest threats to rhododendrons is a forest pest called sudden oak death. It's also sometimes called Phytophthora remorum, which is its scientific name. Or sometimes people abbreviate that to P. remorum. Um, and that is currently found in an infestation um, in California and Oregon. However, it travels in uh, water and there are infested um, nurseries with nursery stock like uh, potted plants um, on, okay. in the Western United States that uh, while they take a lot of actions to reduce the infestations or even get rid of the infestations, every once in a while mistakes are made and nursery materials can be shipped out of the Western United States in the infested zones into the Eastern US. And so one real concern because sudden oak death is a really bad name for that pest. It affects rhododendrons very, very badly is that the Eastern native range of rhododendrons, and I believe azaleas too, could be affected by sudden oak death, which again, terrible name, doesn't just affect oaks. So that's one pest that um, it's good to understand more about from a professional standpoint. From a sort of homeowner standpoint, I highly recommend that anybody who's excited about these sorts of things download the iNaturalist app or whatever your favorite app is, whether it's iNaturalist or there's um, 
there's one that I will make sure to get to Amy uh, for posting on the website because I'm just forgetting the name of it and I'm sorry. But there's a couple different apps where you can report or even just um, upload pictures of your most concerning tree issues. And then um, people can comment on whether or not it's actually a forest pest or like I was kind of joking around with everybody, maybe it's just a yellow bellied sap sucker um, doing totally normal woodpecker things. Um, but it's important to, to be inquisitive about the trees in your backyard. Um, so while I don't have like a particular insect that's coming for this, the uh, trees of Pennsylvania, I would say one of the most important things that we can all do in this world is really be curious about the trees around us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we had a question come in that says, we had an oak blister this year. Could this be related to the pine blister that you mentioned? Oh, um, <laughs> white pine blister rust uh, was the um, pathogen that I mentioned quite some time ago, um, right at the beginning of the talk. Generally speaking, um, the diseases especially usually affect really specific types of trees. And so while there are plenty of types of threats to oak trees, um, specifically white pine blister rust would not affect oak trees. However, there's plenty of things that might potentially be problematic on oak trees. Oaks are an incredibly variable group of trees and they have a spectacular number of native not very harmful insects and diseases that make their lives as part of the natural ecosystem in oaks. And some of those things go up and down in cycles. So one year you might have tons of oak galls on the leaves, like big brown blisters on the leaves. And those are native insects that are um, living within the leaves and changing the dynamic of how the leaf grows, but they're not necessarily harmful. This kind of goes back to what I said just a few minutes ago, which is there's such an in intensely interesting world around trees um, and downloading some of these apps, if you're comfortable with using apps and, and taking pictures of things like um, galls or unusual insects on your trees can be really fascinating, both for you and really scientifically important for the scientists that use that information. So for homeowners and kind of the general public, um, as far as resources go, do you have kind of like go-to sites that you would suggest people visit for more information about invasive, invasive pests and diseases? You know, is cooperative extensions something that, you know, they should be checking and getting resources from? Yeah, uh, the Pennsylvania State University Cooperative Extension is a great resource. Most states have something like that, and Pennsylvania is certainly one of them. Um, Pennsylvania also has the, I think it's DCNR. I'm sorry, they all have different names. It is. Yes, <laughs> they DCNR. Have an, <laughs> yeah, they have an extensive um, library of information on forestry issues that I would, of course, recommend. Um, it is different in every state, and it really uh, is regional. And so I would say those would be the places I would always suggest. The other thing is um, botanical gardens and arboreta like yourselves. Um, there's lots of interesting ones in the greater eastern seaboard that have amazing resources. Um, so uh, not only the Jenkins, but also any other arboreta in the larger area might have really cool information about local trees and shrubs and so forth and the threats that might um, they might be facing. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, does anyone else have any questions for Lee? I have some other stuff to add if we're feeling a little Go for it. short on questions. I think one of the sure. really interesting problems with forest pests is that they are so variable. They are all totally different and um, they share things. So for instance, both the emerald ash borer and the Asian longhorn beetle can be moved on firewood, but other pests cannot or in all practically cannot, in all practicality cannot. So for instance, another forest pest that has caused a lot of damage in Pennsylvania is the hemlock woolly adelgid, which kills mm -hmm. Eastern hemlocks, which is an incredibly important tree to damp soils and creek sides and um, mountains and things like that. It is 
extremely unlikely that you would move hemlock, woolly, adelgid, and firewood. Its life cycle has nothing to do with dry pieces of wood. I mean, it's, it's possible in a completely nutty scenario, but it's just never going to realistically happen under any sort of, let's just say, realistic world. <laughs> so it's fascinating because each one of these forest pests and pathogens has its own ecology that comes into play with the human world. So how do these things move um, in a human world is much more important than sort of the, the basics of, of what we think of them. So you can think, okay, well, I won't move any firewood and then I can't cause any trouble. Well, it, that's not entirely true because of course, things like spotted lanternfly they can lay eggs on something as silly as a cinder block or um, a wheelbarrow or a doghouse. Then you move those things. And because the spotted lanternfly eggs, are, they're sort of gray and pasty looking and kind of don't look like much at all, you could easily move them accidentally when you're uh, renting a new home across the state or some other pretty uh, typical behavior. So it's where people intersect the pests that I think is really fascinating. Agreed, yes. And I think, you know, when spotted lanternfly was first announced in our area, you know, doing car checks and thinking and learning more about the behaviors of that insect and that it was attracted to shiny things and flat things and siding. And, you know, it was things that you probably, you know, weren't used to or what you wouldn't think of um, that an insect would be going for. So um, I, I, I like that you brought up that point that each has its own life cycle and its own idiosyncrasies. And it is really thinking about how it um, plays and impacts with, with the human world and, and learning those pieces so that we can help not be a, a part of the problem, but more a part of the solution. That's exactly right. And um... There is a point at which forest pests in some cases get to get to an area or get to a point where your behaviors are not going to make a big difference. So as an easy example of spotted lanternfly, if you have two heavily infested areas, it unfortunately doesn't make any difference if you're moving things in between them because they both already have spotted lanternfly. But Forest pests in general don't live everywhere. You know, they, they, there might be plenty of spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania, but there is, you know, none in Kansas and they would love to keep it that way. So it's really important to sort of know how um, your actions might matter in different conditions and different decisions and, and different places. Mm -hmm. Right, Robert came with a question that says, are there any natural predators for the various pests you've mentioned? Yes, absolutely. And that's such a good question because that gets at the heart of the problem of what an invasive species is. So invasive species specifically cause significant damage in either uh, environmental places, such as a forest, uh, human health or economic realms, right? So for instance, um, spotted lanternfly, to just keep using that example because it's on our minds, you know, it's really damaging uh, vineyards and apple orchards, right? So that's an economic and an environmental damage. But there's also a lot of non-native, excuse me, there's also a lot of non-native insects and pests that are not invasive. They did basically do kind of nothing. They kind of just live here. And that is not necessarily disastrous. So the difference between an invasive species and a non-native species is that the invasive species have gone pretty bonkers. And a big part of that is that invasive species often do not have native predators or diseases that affect them. So there's nothing keeping them in check. That doesn't mean there's nothing eating them. Um, sometimes they still sometimes get eaten by frogs or woodpeckers or birds or whatever, but not at the level that would bring them to the point where they acted like a normal native insect. Um, so every single one of the forest pests that I've mentioned that are big enough to be eaten get eaten by something in North America, but it's not to the point that it actually controls their population. So they are able to breed and spread at a really high rate, 
unnaturally high rate. And that's the nature of an invasive species. There's some really cool science going on right now about spotted lanternfly because it is kind of the new kid on the block about what eats spotted lanternfly. And you can actually send photographs to the scientists of like, I saw this spider eating a spotted lanternfly or I saw this praying mantis eating a spotted lanternfly or whatever. Uh, and it's really fascinating, the incredible variation of things that are totally willing to eat spotted lanternfly, but it's not enough. They breed really fast and they spread really fast and there's not enough praying mantises to keep control of them at all. <laughs> Um, while I understand that it was a non-native praying mantis, which I'm not thrilled to have in my garden, um, one was living around the our back door. And we, my daughter and I started catching spotted lanternflies and bringing them home and throwing them <laughs> onto the door to watch what it would do because, come on. And uh, yeah, praying mantises can catch them and it's pretty awesome. Now again, another non-native pest, which, you know, I guess we put praying mantises just in the non-native pest and not any form of invasive. They don't have invasive status, but I know they're not, they're not the best. <laughs> you know, the, the praying mantises that we've brought in for agricultural purposes are pretty much in that non, non-native group. You know, they don't yeah. really cause a huge amount of problems. Um, they don't uh, create massive infestations. They're not edging any other native insects towards extinction that we're aware of. Um, they are kind of in that group where it's like, well, maybe we ought not to have released them. Um, that's fair because there's native praying mantises and perhaps it's not the greatest thing that um, was ever decided, but they are not uh, rising to the level of an invasive species. That's good to hear. <laughs> <laughs> to the best of my knowledge. And again, that might be regional. Yes. I know here in the state of Montana, the, um, the praying mantises basically had a very good year. And so everybody noticed that uh, the non-native praying mantises had a very good year and they're kind of everywhere. Um, mm. And I don't know why that is, but I don't believe they're invasive. Yeah. All right. Was there anything else, Lee, that you had on your list that you wanted to share? Otherwise... I feel like everyone's gotten, at this point, probably have gotten their questions out. I think I'm all set, but I really appreciate the opportunity. Yes, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This was extremely informative. And I think um, just thinking about those concepts of, of not moving firewood, even though you might've heard it before, it's really good to reinforce and, and learn the reasons behind. So again, thank you for taking the time out to be with us tonight. And for everyone who's still with us out there listening, um, our next third Thursday lecture will be November 17th. And we will be talking about the owls of the mid-Atlantic region. So we'll be shifting over to birds, which Lee, it sounds like you're a love birder. You'd like that one. Um, so hopefully some of you will tune in next month. And again, Lee, thank you so much for, for being with us tonight. And we hope everyone has a good, good evening. Thank you. Bye everybody.